Tracing Your Family Roots, I'm Chuck Mason. With me, my co-host is Janelle Blue. Janelle is the president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society and also our sponsoring organization. And with us today is Paul McFarlane. Paul is the leader of the special interest group on Irish research for the Fairfax Genealogical Society. And this is kind of our second segment on doing Irish research. We did an earlier one on research, and now we're going to continue. So welcome, Paul. Well, we're thank you. Thank you for having you, me. I enjoy it. You could make it with us. And we had kind of talked about things with Irish research, and now we want to talk a little more in depth about it. And one of the big questions is, do I have to get on a plane and go to Ireland to do my research? Uh, the answer is no, but you should. <laughs> <laughs> Only in the sense that you should visit Ireland. Yeah. Uh, but you, you cannot go there with the anticipation that you're going to be able to find your records. You need to do all of your research here and I would recommend that not only do you do all that research, but you contact somebody in Ireland, forward them the material you have, ask them for assistance, and then they meet with them when you get there, and then uh, do, your, uh, do your research. Uh, you, 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 your records are here in the United States. Immigration records, census records, uh, LDS has many, many, many records of baptisms and, uh, and uh, such things. So you should do your research here. And importantly, don't be too ambitious in what you're going to find. You, you may not be able to find that ancestor because the, the records may not exist. Uh, there was no requirement in Ireland to be keeping records much before the mid-1800s. So. Uh, in my own case, I've been able to trace it back to 1825 only because they were the third name on the record that was being kept. <laughs> Other than that, if it had been uh, three months earlier, the name wouldn't have been there. Yeah. But, so. and, and you said uh, contacting someone, sending your stuff over to Ireland for them to look at it. Where might somebody find who to contact? Uh, the, the very last slide that we have here, I have, is called Heritage Centers. Okay. And there's a Heritage Center in every county. And they are, they are there to assist people who are doing research. And you can contact them directly via email uh, for a fee. I mean, they're, that's why they were established, was for a fee. But importantly, they have records that may not be on, currently online. Right. And secondly, they know the area in which they are resident. What was the old townland's name like? What is the family name like? What are they known as today, perhaps? Uh, they can take you to cemeteries that you will never find where people might be buried. But in order to do that, they have to have as much material as you have. Because if you say, I'm looking for Chuck Mason, there are 15 Chuck Masons maybe in that area, and they need to know <clears throat> Chuck's brothers, Chuck's father, et cetera, so that they can help you find what you're looking for. Also, I would think it would be very helpful if you would be able to determine what county or what region of Ireland they were from. And by you know thinking about when did they come to the U.S., and where did they go? That would give you a clue as to maybe whether they were Scots-Irish, and then therefore that would lead you to a different county than if they were you know, coming during the potato famine, and that would maybe give you some clue too. Because otherwise, you, you'd have to send it to all the counties. Yeah, that's why you have to do your research here to f try to find, narrow that down. Yeah. Many times, uh, they, the, those who could afford it on their cemetery markers, they put native of county such and such. Now that at least gets you into the county. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't get you into the townland that you may be looking for, but it gets you into that county. And you, you oftentimes will find in 
uh, turn in uh, records for naturalization, mm. that they are a native of county such and such. More often it'll just say Ireland, but uh, it may in fact say county, which gets you to the heritage center that you might need. So, and of course, we touched on this in the first show, but uh, basically you said that the Family History Library out in Salt Lake has been allowed to copy a lot of the records, so that's a good starting place to, to get started. Yes, and their website, Family Search, is the best website to get started on doing Irish research. Not only does it have the records, but for those who are interested in getting started, their wiki has yeah. great news and videos that will help you do this work. Where do I want to start? And it'll walk you through step by step by step. So I highly recommend. Uh, yeah, and one of the other resources too is they, they do have a lot of education classes on the website, which is also free. Yes. Uh, that, that you can take and watch those and it's as good as basically being in one of the classes. I've watched a few of those, and, and I've also been in Salt Lake and gone to a couple of the classes that they hold there in the library. So it, it's a good resource. Uh, and you did mention for those in this area, the McLean Family History Center has a lot of resources right there in the library. Right. Thanks be to Linda Jonas, who in the uh, early, around 2000, 2001, I think, Linda came into the area, and she was the big push to get Irish, uh, Scottish, Welsh, English, and German resources into the library there. So That's there's exactly a right. lot yes, of yes. good information there that, they, that you can start looking at. So. Uh, if I were to go to Ireland, you know, what all do I need to know before I can actually make that big step of getting on a plane and going? Uh, you, you need to know who, who your ancestors were by name, and the name that you think they should be spelled by is not necessarily the name <laughs> that they were spelled by <laughs> when they came in. And as much as I uh, don't like to dispel myths, those names weren't changed when they came through immigration. No. <laughs> they, they were changed in Ireland or when they got here by themselves because, uh, as you know, many of them couldn't read or write, so they didn't know what their name was supposed to look like, so <laughs> however the name spelled, the sounded, that's how it was spelled. But you need to know something specific about where in the county they actually came from. And if you look here at the names, you can see there's lots of variations, and I just use Breslin for example. Vowels are interchangeable in many of the Irish names. I's, A's, O's, U's, they substitute what they wanted. <laughs> and names in the first names, there are 10 male and 10 female, for the most part, that predominate in, uh, in Ireland because of the Catholic naming conventions. And, and you've seen them, Patrick and Seamus, which is James, but the names will be in, potentially in Irish. They could be in Latin mm -hmm. instead of uh, when they were baptized. Uh, they could be in an English variation of what the name sounds like because it was the English who were writing these names down. They were, the, for the most part, that were the people who are putting them. So you need to know that, and then you need to know the specific area in the country, uh, in the county, like the parish. And we talked about that earlier, the numbers of parishes in different counties. The parish will get you closer to the area that you specifically want to get to. And then using either a genealogist or the Family Heritage Center, uh, you will be able to locate your, your your, there I mentioned there that there are 60,000 townlands in Ireland. So you trying to find yours, I went through a, a reference book here several years ago uh, looking at my townland name begins with Bally, B-A-L-L-Y, where there were 32 
uh, different valleys in one county. <laughs> so, uh, you know. You so, what would that equate to, say, in a county here in the United States? A what county here in the United States would be the equivalent of a state. Okay. Like the state of California. And a okay. parish is the same as in Louisiana. Okay. It's a county. Uh, Fairfax County would be Fairfax Parish. Uh -huh. And uh, the, uh, the townland, I, I, I remember mm -hmm. or I think more of the uh, settlement Kingstown in Alexandria. Okay. Kingstown has little divisions within it that are their little population area. Well, that would be the townland in Ireland. Would mm. be you wouldn't be okay. known as you come from. Okay. That area, mm. and and they're in Irish, Irish. So they're sometimes difficult to spell and <laughs> pronounce. Uh, so mine mine could come from uh, from anywhere up in the Northern Ireland or down south. You know, and if someone were looking for maps to try and determine, do you have a recommendation of where you might find a good map collection? The, the best maps were, uh, and they are currently online, fortunately, uh, were done by the British Ordnance Survey when they surveyed all of Ireland. And you can get a map that will be one mile to six inch, I think is the equivalent. So it's very, very detailed. And using Google, you can locate where your townland was, okay. or it still is, it hasn't mm -hmm. changed, it still is there. And in these ordnance survey maps, it will actually show you the layout of the land. Some of the structures would still be there, and on Google Map, you'll be able to see them. And of course, using the GPS from Google, you can get you, get you directly to them. Unfortunately, trying to get around in Ireland on your own, you won't be able to find many of these places. That's why I always recommend you use either a heritage center or a, a a genealogist that's, that's familiar with the area. Yeah. Now, some of us have ancestors who still live there, right. and, and that's even better. That's, better. that's, yeah, that's the best. That's always, that's <laughs> yeah. always good. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not sure, do they drive on the wrong side of the yes. road yes. like yes. they do? It? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So, so, of course, when I went to England and Scotland, I took public transportation. Yes. I was not about to chance driving. And I know there are people who are brave enough to, to do that. So, you know, we're, we're talking about finding where they were. You know, did most people in Ireland own the land or were they renting land? You know, most people did not own the land. They were tenant farmers so for the most part. So what about land records? So the, is there going to be anything for that or is it going to be like here if you rented a piece of land or a house or anything else, there's probably not going to be many public records. Fortunately, there are, there are records okay. of, of the tenant farmers, farmers. because uh, the, the English wanted to tax the land its true value, so they established a survey back in uh, the 1830s that lasted for 30 years where they went through and evaluated every piece of land and they identified who was the tenant on it okay. and who was the landlord and who was the owner. So the owner could have been uh, the Earl of Gosford, for example, and he may have owned thousands of acres, but he had sublet this to a an overseer who had sublet it to the tenant farmer. Okay. And those names are there and they are listed and you can find them. The problem is it's only the head of household and there could have been many families living in the same tenant area. Uh, so they were all land, not landowners, but it became, they became landowners in the 1900s. Okay. But uh, prior to that, they were all tenants. Okay. But, the, but at least there's more hope than you have in the United States where your ancestors renting a piece of land and it was a private yeah. agreement. Yeah, this identified them. And if you can identify them on that piece of land, the Irish have kept all of the land records up to the present time, 
and identified who was on that land, how it transferred, and why, in many cases, it lists that the person moved to the United States, or North America, as they say, and uh, you would be able to uh, follow that right up to the present time, that piece of land. Where are those land records? They are in the uh, records office in, wa in, in, either, in, in either Belfast for Northern Ireland uh -huh. or in Dublin. Yeah. yeah. And the ones in Belfast are online. You can actually look yeah. at them online at the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. So they probably were not there when they had the big explosion? Uh, they were, they were the Public Records right. Office, the land records were not, yeah. Oh, and okay. they, fortunately, they were not in the GRO office, they were in the land record office, yeah. Was it, it, it also, wor weren't there different locations where people immigrated from it, it, you know, like in Northern Ireland, you, you could say that the Scots-Irish immigrated at a certain point of, in time. There were groups of them that came from a certain region at a certain time. So if you knew that, would that help pinpoint? It, it helps with the Scots-Irish more than it does with the Irish-Irish, okay. Okay. Uh, the, the non-Scots-Irish. Uh, because many of the Scots-Irish immigrated en masse, whole right. areas moved with their, in many cases, their Presbyterian minister. Right. And they packed up and they moved and they came to the United States and they settled in a, rec in a place where there was record keeping and they, uh, they yeah. are there. The others left, uh, particularly the famine Irish, just got on a ship and got out. Okay. Uh, and it's hard to tell where they actually went to. So th th that's the other part, that when you ask your ancestor, where was my ancestor from, and they say, well, th they came from, and they'll say Cork. That may have been where they got on the ship. ship. Right. But they yeah. had to get there to get on the ship, yeah. and so you have to be very careful about accepting those stories. And, and I'm assuming that Ireland was like with Scotland and England, depending on the port you were coming from, where they may have, have come to North America and probably the cost of getting there. Uh, my Scottish ancestors came from, from uh, Glasgow into Philadelphia, but I've run into someone in a class one time where her ancestors were from Glasgow, but they went down to Liverpool, and it was cheaper to go from Liverpool to Baltimore and take the train up mm -hmm. to Philadelphia. They they ended up all in Philadelphia, but went a different route. And I'm I'm suspecting that that's probably true of Ireland also. Yes, uh, it, it it was. Uh, they they went to the nearest port wherever that might be, that they heard about. Uh, there were recruiters in, the, uh, in Ireland who were recruiting people to come to the United States. And they would uh, tell them, you know, we, we can get you aboard a ship leaving from Londonderry, and people would head to Londonderry, or yeah. we can get you aboard a ship leaving from Cork or wherever, or in many cases, they went to Glasgow themselves and okay. sailed from, Ireland, they went to Glasgow and sailed back to the United States from there, again because of price. And the shipping companies were advertising too. Yes, they were. So Very they were much. recruiting. Yeah. Very much uh, recruiting. And, and of course, I'm, I'm sure that we had also the migration into Canada like we did other, other uh, countries in the British Isles. Many of the Irish went through uh, Canada. They first uh, came in through Quebec. Uh, but the ones that came into the New England area, you will find them coming through St. John, New Brunswick. Okay. And there are good mm -hmm. records in St. John, New Brunswick uh, of Americans, excuse me, English, uh, Irish arriving and then uh, coming down to the United States, States. either by train mm -hmm. uh, or however they could get their steamer ship themselves would bring them down into Boston. Uh, the, the Irish, moved, had trade relations with Canada dating back to 1700s, uh, particularly into the Newfoundland area, they would, uh, would trade with them. 
because it wasn't too it was far across the ocean to come back and forth. Well, so. it was all part of the Commonwealth. It was all part the of the Canada Commonwealth, Commonwealth. and yeah. Yeah. that was why some of them went to Canada because they were moving them they, from one part of, quote, England or the United Kingdom to another part of the United Kingdom. Did they have to have any kind of permission or passports or anything, authorization to be able to leave the Ireland no. and to immigrate? No. Are no. there There's no records of them saying to the civil courts that they were going to leave and... No, I, I think the Germans used, used that, yeah. but the Irish did not use that. So that's one of the problems we have in locating them. There are no record key, records that say these people left from this, mm. this area. Mm. So it was all uh, imposed upon the receiving country to identify that they were there. And that, of course, was the steamships themselves that had to keep track of who was on board. So we get our ancestors back to Ireland. What kind of records are we going to find for them? Well, are there great records. The vital records or census or things like that? Oh, there's census records from 1901 and 1911. And many of the people who came to the United States in the uh, 1860s, 70s, and 80s still had ancestors living in Ireland so they are in the 1901 census. Uh, there are birth records that are available to people. There are marriage records that are available to people. There are baptismal records that are available to people that will tell them who these, uh, who these people were, who their grandparents might have been, who their siblings, un unknown to them, that their ancestors had these siblings. Those are all available. But they're available here in the United States too online. So, you know, for typical vital record for a birth, what kind of information, how does it compare to something you might find here in, uh, for the United in the, States? In the 1864, when it first started, they had to have the individual's name of the, date of the birth, the date of birth, the father's name, the mother's maiden name, unusual, the location, which is the townland in which they were, uh, were uh, born, and who reported it? And oftentimes, it's the father or the mother who's reporting it. Uh -huh. So there's a, a good record there. It's not just a name, but this is uh, uh, an actual family record now once you can find that. In the marriage records, likewise, it gives you the, the, the wife and the spouse, uh, I mean, both spouses, and both fathers, but no mothers. No mothers. And. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, they were supposed to give the father's name whether they were living or deceased, but you'll go through and find marriage records where the father's name is listed as deceased instead of John um, deceased. It's listed as de deceased, deceased, so it doesn't help you. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, funeral records or burial records or death records are few and far between. Yeah. It just wasn't something that they spent a lot of time mm -hmm. working on. What about cemeteries? cemeteries yeah. there, there are cemeteries, uh, but they, they're sort of hit and miss as far as gravestones. And record keeping is almost non-existent of uh, who's interred in, in what part of the cemetery. You, you really need to have uh, somebody again on the ground who remembers what, what is there and who is there. Are most of the churches still there? I mean, if you went back to early 1800s, would those little parish or the little village churches or? I would say m not most, several are, but uh, they, like here in the United States, they consolidated parishes and built bigger churches to, uh, to accommodate them. Uh -huh. So the old, older churches kind of just deteriorated. Okay. And, uh, and went away. And maybe the records went with them? No, the church records usually did not go disappear. Uh, they, they, they transferred the church records. Okay, so that's are, good. Are they willing to, you know, or receptive if you contact the churches, you know? They, they traditionally uh, do, do not like you walking in, knocking on the door. door. And the reason for that is they've all been microfilmed once, sometimes twice, once by the, Briti uh, the uh, LDS, once by the, the Irish government for the Heritage Center usage. So they think they've provided that information. Mm -hmm. So uh, their attitude is, you know, we, we got other things to do uh, mm -hmm. than, than 
So you want to do your other work first, and then if you don't find it, contact right. them. Right, and, and uh, I've had some, uh, uh, some people tell me that they contact them by, via email and say, I'm going to be in the area, and if it is all possible, could I stop by, rather than just knocking on the door, and they have found that that is more, re more receptive to mm -hmm. the uh, parish. And what about websites? Do you have some? Oh yes, in fact, there's a, there's a couple <laughs> of slides there. If we could put one up there on websites, there's, a, there's a free, and I mentioned that free, free websites. You can see there's the census records up there, there's civil birth, marriage, death records, there's a, a family search. I mentioned it's a great place to start. And that swilson.info is my favorite spot for trying to find town lands in Ireland. Uh, the next website will tell you, uh, the next slide please, will show you that there's uh, the archives government is where you find uh, uh, what is going on in Ireland. John Grenham's blog, he's the premier genealogist in Ireland. I say, uh, I read him every week. Uh, he's got great news on there. Uh, Steve Morse, I think you're f all familiar with that, is great for immigration records and uh, there's, there's plenty of great websites, I think, for, uh, for helping you with your Irish research. Well, time has moved quickly. <laughs> we really appreciate you coming and talking to us a second time, Paul, and at some point we're going to have to have you back because we're really just touching on yes, the surface yes. of Irish research. So yep. Janelle, do you want to do a plug for Mount Vernon? A well, absolutely. Just um, in general, you know, join your local uh, genealogy society because then you're going to find a lot of people who have your same interest. Be sure to join us too uh, every uh, Tuesday, it's the third Tuesday of every month for a, our meeting.